nation. Whitney Davis said the hatred she expressed to Bobby Cutts Jr. for the murder of her sister didn't have the outcome she expected. I mean, it really didn't do anything for me. I thought I would feel so much better after getting that off my chest, but it was just, he seemed to have no emotion or reaction to what I was saying. Did the fact that you forgave him publicly create any kind of strain in family relations? I was a little concerned. None of this makes sense. But I, I had to be true to myself. And when Patty Porter finally faced her moment in front of Cuts, she followed through with the decision she had made. I serve an amazing God, Bobby, a God that forgives. And I made up my mind that I would forgive you. Porter had taken responsibility for Blake, the son that Cuts had fathered with her murdered daughter. And she believed that in an important way, Blake's life was also in the balance. I would have never been able to raise Blake and hate you. And your honor, I pray that you make a way for this man to someday be able to get out of there and to hold his son. And I hope you pray that I'm able to raise him to forgive you. He knows what you did. There was a sign of emotion from Cuts, a tear, after Porter completed her statement. But he did not speak at this hearing. Mr. Cuts, if you'll please stand. And he showed no emotion when, at the age of 30, he was sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole only after he has served 57 years. To Patty Porter, the focus returns to her life and to Blake's future. I didn't think I could raise my grandson to be any kind of a man if I was full of hate and anger. My daughter would have never wanted that either. Me forgiving him didn't change anything as far as what was gonna happen to him, um, but it changed me. And it's almost like it gave me the freedom to just mourn my daughter's loss and not feel that awful rage that happens to you when you choose not to forgive people. I was not gonna let this destroy me as well. Patty Porter reports that she and Blake are doing well. Bobby Lee Cutts Jr. remains in prison. In 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court denied his appeal. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID. Coming up on 2020 on ID, a vivacious three-year-old girl. I remember I was always into stuff, you know, smiling big for the camera. Then... Papa, please don't hurt me. Papa, please don't. Papa, please don't cut me. Papa, please don't cut me. She had her throat cut from ear to ear. Left alone in a field. She was here for 36 hours with her two dead sisters. One clean cut. None of us cried. It was silent. My lambs led to a slaughter. And a father nowhere to be found. The suspect is described as hard drinking, gun loving, and hot tempered. Right now he's bent on killing other people. What made Ramon Salcido kill his family? I had never seen the level of viciousness. Are you a more for what you did? Uh, not really. And will there be answers for the daughter left behind? Evil. 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 Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's often said that childhood wounds run deep, but few can imagine the depth of suffering Carmina Salcido endured. As Jay Shadler first reported in 2009, for 20 years after her chilling ordeal, her fate remained largely unknown until now. Between the ocean and the mountains lies a place called the Valley of the Moon. Its beauty ripens at dawn into vineyards so perfect they look as if they were painted onto the land. But legends say beneath the blessings of this place lies a curse. Maybe it's the moon or the wine, but evil has a home here too. In 1910, an immigrant went on a rampage, butchering and burning his entire family. The local paper called it the most atrocious crime in the history of Sonoma County but it's not anymore. I have been a part of uh, well over 100 homicide investigations uh, during the course of my career, but I had never seen the level of viciousness and 
That was startling even to me. Mike Brown is a retired detective captain with the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. He collects vintage cars in mint condition, quite unlike his memories, which have been damaged beyond repair. Did you have flashbacks? Yes, I, I had all of that. I, uh, the dreams, uh, flashbacks, uh, smells. Not far away, 23-year-old Carmina Salcedo puts in 30 hours a week as a dog groomer. The only living things she really trusts are these animals and Mike Brown. Detective Mike Brown was, you know, that father figure that I never had. What do you get from Detective Brown that you haven't gotten from any other? Understanding. He understands, you know, what I saw, what I went through. Carmina feels so close to you. I'm very touched by that. Mike and Carmina have only seen each other a few times in the past 20 years. But 2020 brought them together for a rare and remarkable reunion at the Vianza Vineyards. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Hi, Carmina. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Here, overlooking the Valley of the Moon and over a glass of red wine, a bright future. two scarred but surviving souls begin to remember April 14, 1989. On 4-14-89, at approximately 0820 hours, I was advised that an individual in the Sonoma Valley area had been the victim of a gunshot wound. Morning mist is just beginning to burn off the Kundi Estates vineyards when Detective Brown pulls into the main driveway. The winery supervisor, Ken Boothy, has been shot, though not fatally. And so we came out here to talk to him. Did he know the guy who was shooting him? He did. He told us that uh, the man who shot him was Ramon Salcido. Ramon Salcido is a hard-working, hard-drinking, 28-year-old vineyard employee. His young wife, Angela, comes from a staunch local Catholic family. She's begun to dream of being a model. Together, they make a striking couple. When you talk to people about your mom, mm -hmm. how do they describe her? What was she like? Innocent, charming, naive, sweet, you know. I'm told that you look a lot like your mom. Have you I been do. told that? Yes. You know, the same eyes, the same lips. How about that laugh? <laughs> and the laugh, definitely the laugh. <laughs> like a magnet, Angela's prim and proper past draws her to the wild side of this handsome Mexican immigrant. Soon after their wedding, in quick succession, three beautiful daughters, Sofia, Carmina, and Teresa. Sofia was a very quiet, reserved uh, child. Very, very thoughtful, very smart, she was the oldest, and then it was me, who was crazy, always into stuff, you know, climbing up the drapes and, you know, smiling big for the camera, and, and maybe Teresa was sort of the in-between of both of us, you know. You know, my mom was very creative, taking pictures of us at playtime. She'd be very, oh, we're going to put the three of you little kids in a box and you see. But those bright memories of her sisters and mom fade to black when Carmina recalls her father. I was very intimidated and scared of my dad. He would come home and be drunk, obliterated, and you know, there I remember fights going on between him and my mom. And he just started, you know, slapping and punching her. Sophia was holding baby Teresa up, you know, we just all stand back there with, you know, big eyes and just watch terrified. Detective Brown knows nothing about these troubles in the Salcedo house. He's just looking for Ramon. But even before he can leave the scene of the vineyard shooting, he gets another call. I was advised that a homicide victim had been found at another winery approximately two miles away from the scene of the first shooting. Detective Brown isn't the only one who hears about this second shooting. I keep my police scanner in my purse. I was the cop reporter at the time and um, kept it on. Randy Rosman is a beat reporter for the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. I remember because of all the chatter on the scanner, I was nervous. Then I heard they had a 187, which is code for a homicide. Less than two miles from the first shooting site, another winery supervisor, Tracy Tuvey, is ambushed, dying of a bullet wound to his head. The lower portion of his body was in the car, but the upper portion of his body had fallen out of the car and was lying on the dirt road. So by 9 a.m., Detective Brown has two crime scenes, two victims, and one common thread. Both of the victims are vineyard supervisors of Ramon Salcido. And co-workers say lately he's been mixing booze and cocaine. 
if Tracy would tell him to do something, he'd flip him off behind his back or do something like that, you know, pissed that he had to take orders off him. So there's trouble at work and tensions at home with his wife, Angela. To help bring in money, she's begun modeling classes. That's Angela learning to take a turn on the runway. She photographed beautifully, and she said that they needed the money. But Ramon doesn't like the idea. Jealousy is seeping into his thoughts. He drove back and forth in front of their house several times a day. He thought that his wife was having an affair. As she grew more confident, your, your father grew more jealous. Yes. What's more, in just the last few days, Angela has learned Ramon has fathered a child with another woman, and he's still legally married to her. A court is ordering him to begin paying $500 a month in child support. So now the tensions between Angela and Ramon need only a spark to explode. And Ramon finds it. His suspicion that four-year-old Sophia is not his child will turn out to be right. A DNA test will prove it. And Angela may now believe that her only choice is to run as fast as she can toward a new life. She actually had an interview, a photo shoot to do that day, and she said, I won't miss it. I won't miss it. April 14th, at 5.30 in the morning, Angela slips out of their tiny house and goes to an ATM withdrawing the little money she has for a photo shoot this afternoon. She doesn't know it, but this will be her final close-up. Back at the vineyard where Tracy Tuvey has been killed, something odd is happening. For a homicide, where are all the police and detectives? And there was just one detective here, that's all. And uh, I asked him what was going on, and he told me that there'd been a homicide here, but that everybody had just left because there'd been a call of another homicide. 201 Baines Avenue, eight miles from the first shooting, six miles from the second crime scene. It is the home of Ramon and Angela Salcedo and their three daughters. Detective Brown and his partner think Ramon may still be inside. What do you see? Uh, I see some blood on the front door. I brought my 45 up and looked, made a quick sweep of the house. I could see blood on an interior wall. I popped back down, told him what I saw. The door was closed. The door was closed. He reached over and pushed the door open slightly to make sure that there was no one back there. You could see a body that was lying in the hallway right over there. It's Angela Salcedo. How had she been killed? She had been shot in the head. He, she was shot three times. Equally chilling, three tricycles standing alone on the front steps, and no sign of Sofia, Carmina, or Teresa. I came from down below on the main highway and parked down here. Once again, reporter Randy Rossman arrives, only to find that this story is moving faster than either the cops or the press can comprehend. Something was changing, something was different. The detectives all started kind of meeting and talking and um, something new is going on. 20 miles from where the terror began, three more bodies. My God, what's going through your mind at this point? Now you've got, you've got deaths all over this county. Well, who, who potentially could be next? Uh, where are the girls? And uh, when will he stop? When we come back, the trail of terror continues. Upon entering the residence, I could see some blood stains on the inside of the front door. And a frightened community wonders, when will it end? And right now, he's bent on, on killing other people. Stay with us. I like to drive through the trees. I like to drive past the vineyards, through the hills. We have beautiful oak studded hills. Mike Brown loves the scenery in Sonoma. It's a beautiful distraction from those memories that still travel from April 14th, 1989, when he was still Detective Sergeant Brown, and Sonoma County was waking up with a madman on the loose. Already this morning, a vineyard supervisor has been killed, and another shot. Two miles from the wineries in Boys Hot Springs, a young mother, an aspiring actress named Angela Salcedo, is murdered at close range in her home. Her husband, Ramon, is the prime suspect, and their three young daughters, Sophia, Carmina, and Teresa, are missing. Is there any question in your mind at this point that we're talking about uh, one man doing all of this? 
I was even more convinced at this point that um, one man was responsible for all of these shootings. But for the moment, my main concern was where are those kids and are they safe? Events are now racing ahead of questions and answers. There's word of a slaughter in Katati, 20 miles away. Angela Salcedo had relatives in Katati. The Katati officers went there and uh, made entry into the house and found three more bodies. At approximately 1100 hours, I was telephoned by Detective Sergeant Mike Brown. He advised me to respond to 8393 Lakewood Drive in Katati. Randy Beeler had called in sick this morning, but he's Brown's most trusted detective, and he's needed here. Upon entering the residence, I could see some blood stains on the inside of the front door. I noticed more blood stains close to the kitchen on the rug. The street was blocked off, and they were putting on their booties on their feet and going into the home and, you know, finding this whole new scene. Inside, the bodies of Angela Salcedo's mother, Marion, and Angela's two very young sisters, Mary and Ruth. Located in the kitchen was victim Ruth Richards. She was lying on the floor on her stomach. Maria Richards was lying in the doorway. In the hallway, I noticed Marion Richards. The detectives, they weren't pausing to talk to anybody. You know, they had their hands full. This was really big. The two young girls appear to have been sexually molested and their throats are slashed. We're getting details that we often don't get for a while, that one of the girls may have been sodomized, that at least one of them was almost decapitated. Angela's mother was attacked first in her garage, then slashed and killed when she staggered back inside to defend her daughters. The murder weapon, a 12-inch bread knife, lies on the floor next to her. We have uh, probably the most violent crime that's been committed in the 132-year history of the sheriff's office. Detective Beeler has found a second bedroom partially ransacked. It contains rifles and firearms. Did you suspect that any guns were missing? No, at the time I didn't know what should have been there. And as it turned out, what was missing? The 22 handgun. A 22 caliber Ruger semi-automatic pistol is the weapon that wounded Vineyard Supervisor Ken Booty and killed Tracy Tuvey and Angela Salcedo. And still, Ramon Salcedo is on the move. Right now, he's bent on on killing other people. The murder scene looked like a slaughterhouse. There is now a bigger price on Ramon Salcedo's head. And Terror is taking root in Sonoma County. Do you know what happened to your friends? Mm -hmm. What happened? They got murdered. I'm just shaking. Local schools go into lockdown. With Salcedo still at large, a lot of parents felt it was safer to keep their kids at home. Though the fear is felt locally, the story is now national. Authorities look for a Sonoma Valley vineyard worker accused of killing seven people. Police now believe he may be deranged. At 7 p.m., Ramon Salcedo's car is found. Inside, another knife, an empty bottle of cheap champagne, and photographs of Ramon, Angela, and their girls. There also was a note written in Spanish that he had left in the car. What did it say? The note said, forgive me, God, but this law made me do it. Police suspect that the word law refers to that recent court order requiring Ramon to pay child support. Perhaps, but as evening falls, Detective Brown has something else on his mind. He suddenly remembers something he noticed hours ago at the crime scene over at the Salcedo home. The phone was on the kitchen table, it was bloody, and the personal address book was opened to a page that showed four different people with the last name Salcedo. That included his mother in Los Mochis, Mexico. With his dead wife's body sprawled on the floor, only a few feet from him, Ramon Salcedo places a call to his mother in Mexico. She wants him to come home. And as much as Detective Brown wants to catch him before he kills again, his deepest worry is for those three still missing girls, Sofia, Carmina, and Teresa. We were very concerned uh, about where those girls might be and what the state of their health was. What were your, your theories? Uh, one thought I had was that maybe he's taking them to Mexico. Um, that was hopeful on my part, because if he was taking them to Mexico, maybe they hadn't been harmed. He'll take that thought to bed with him tonight, in the Valley of the Moon. It's now after midnight and you're finally going to bed. Right. What, what do you think? I'm uh, worried about those little girls, and um, I'm wondering where they are, 
and um, I ask God to uh, keep his hand on them. Still ahead, the frantic search for the girls. I got a call that the girls had been found and that they're out here at Stage Gold Quarry and Dump. But are they alive? She had her throat cut from ear to ear. Stay with us. Ramon Salcido is suspected of murdering his wife and her family and kidnapping his three daughters. Authorities fear he may harm them as well. Can they find the girls before it's too late? Here again, Jay Shadler. The morning fog is still lying low. Sonoma County's idyllic wine country wakes up to a bumper crop of horrific headlines. Five are dead. One is wounded. Three young girls are missing, and their father is on the run. The search has widened on the west coast of California down to Mexico. Today, police are using helicopters to search for 28-year-old Ramon Salcido and fear for his three young daughters believed to be with him. The slaughter of Angela Salcido, her mother, two sisters, and a winery employee named Tracy Tuvi has overwhelmed Sonoma County's tiny violent crimes division. The autopsies have to be done in San Francisco. Working on three hours of sleep, Detective Mike Brown is returning from there when his police scanner starts to crack. We're on Highway 101 going over the Golden Gate Bridge. And what are you hearing? I'm hearing this broken radio traffic and uh, voices were um, somewhat excited. But I couldn't make out where and I couldn't make out what it was that they were going to. Up in Sonoma, reporter Randy Rossman is at her desk in the newsroom of the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. By mid-afternoon, I got a call that the girls had been found and that they are out here at Stage Gold Quarry and Dump. So a photographer and myself um, headed out here. The missing girls, four-year-old Sophia, three-year-old Carmina, and two-year-old Teresa, had been dumped with their throats slashed. So where were the girls located? The girls were located out in that field, about uh, 15, 20 feet from the roadway. I just remember I, it was easier to breathe if I kept my head down, and I just kept my head down. It was easier to breathe with your head down? Yeah, and whenever I needed to look up, I got on my tippy toes mm. and stretched myself to try and look over the three foot, you know, grasses that were out there. And I curled up and kept, you know, tucked my knees up. Yeah tucked my chin down, and I curled up and I slept. Right next to the two dead girls was They were found by a transient who was here picking up wood or something, and, and he happened to look over and, and see what he thought were dolls sitting there, lying there in the ground. And then he noticed that one of the dolls moved, and that was Carmina. Oh, my God. I hear this jump, and I hear, oh, my God. And I believe that it's my dad coming back. You thought your dad was coming back. I thought it was Ramon. And all of a sudden, I just, I froze up. I was like, if I play dead, he won't have to do anything else to me. My nightmare was Ramon coming back, finding me. I actually breathe, and he realizes that I'm alive, and I'm going to get hurt now. But another gentleman comes back and comes up to me, and I'm like crying, I'm terrified, I'm shaking. I was like, please don't hurt me, please don't cut me, please don't cut me. And he's, he's crying, and this guy is crying, he's like, no, it's okay, it's okay, I'm not gonna hurt you, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna help you. And he picks me up, and he brings me up to the gravel area, and he calls it the cops, he's like, you know, 911, there's three, you know, babies out here. But two of those babies are dead. The bodies of two of Ramon Salcido's daughters were removed this evening from a garbage dump near Petaluma. We later discovered that they were there for about 36 hours. Carmina was in this field alone, a three-year-old, with a slit throat for 36 hours. She was here for 36 hours with her two dead sisters. With paramedics rushing to the scene, Carmina erases any lingering doubt about who did this. She did actually say something, didn't she? She did. She said, Daddy cut me. The officials come up and they're like, you know, what happened? And I'm like, Daddy cut me, Daddy cut me. You actually can remember yourself saying those words? Yeah. What was he that? He Daddy cut me. Back through time's tunnel, 20 years to childhood. If a three-year-old can remember feelings and impressions, a traumatized three-year-old might remember more. Carmina says she does. You remember 
him picking you up out yes. of the bed. Yes. I remember actually him carrying me out of the house that morning. Shortly after dawn, Ramon Salcido takes Carmina and her two sisters from their beds, puts them into the family car, and drives away. Probably about 15 minutes into driving, I lean up over the front seat and go, Papa, where are we going? He turned around. He was mad. He turned around and gave me such an evil look. He's like, shut up and sit down. There were probably about five more minutes of driving. We hit some gravel. At that point, I look over at my sister, Sophia, and she just has this look of terror on her face. She knows something's terribly wrong. You are the only person who actually was present and now alive. Only witness. To in any way describe what he was like in those moments. Yes. And what was he like? Um evil evil are there any uh, memories of sound mm -mm. there's no crying it was silent like lambs led to a slaughter Carmina remembers her father taking Teresa first he just goes back he grabs her Sophia and I are just standing there he takes you know opens the door puts one leg out the door like this lays her over the lap <laughs> and picks her up and goes. He gets up out of the car, walks over to the grass, and just throws her. The details the are so vivid, they might be doubted. Actions. Not only did he slice her neck, but he took the knife, pulled up the gown, and just slashed over the belly. It just started cutting. But crime scene photos, Armina says she has never seen, appear to confirm her memories. Sophia is next, and then Carmina grabs my hair, pulls my head back. I put my hands up. He actually almost cut this finger off because I had my hands up like this, protecting. So he cut over my fingers and I moved them. I startle, I move my hands out of the way. One clean cut. It was, it's like a razor. You almost don't feel anything. And I just went out. After spending a day, a night, and part of the next day near her dead sisters at the dump, Carmina is rushed to Petaluma Valley Hospital. Detective Brown is on his way there, too. As an investigator, are you thinking, can she tell us something? I was hoping at best she would survive, and I had no expectation uh, with her throat cut the way it was that she would be able to assist us with any information whatsoever. All it did to me was focus me even more on catching Ramon Salcido. You wanted this guy. I wanted him bad. Coming up, young Carmina clings to life. 36 hours alone in that dump. What are the odds of her survival in that? Pretty slim. I was so scared. And here she was in our hands, and I wasn't really sure she was going to make it out of the OR. And Ramon is finally caught. Why did you kill your children? Why did you do that? When we return... Ramon Salcido is still on the run, wanted for the murders of seven people. His daughter Carmina, who survived 36 hours in an open field with her throat slashed, rolled into the ER on a hospital gurney, sits up, because if she lies down, she will die. When we got there, they were just bringing her in through the, through the door. When she arrived, there was no question that there was something about her character and grit that allowed her to survive. She shouldn't have, she shouldn't have survived the injuries that she had. 36 hours alone in that dump. What are the odds of her survival in that? Pretty slim. But then what are the odds of a three-year-old wearing a face of grace and courage? The ER nurses uh, got out a Polaroid camera that they used as kind of standard operating procedure to document an injury. And they advanced toward Carmina with the camera. And Carmina smiled for the picture the way children smile for their pictures. Oh my God. It has stuck in my mind so vividly that the child smiling through those injuries was just incredible. 
Carmina survived those long hours before she was discovered by inadvertently keeping her head down and her neck wound covered. What kind of patient was she? She spent the next five or six days in very critical condition. Uh, but from the moment that she finished her uh, surgical experience, she started to rally. But she was very personable. The nurses, she would laugh. And uh, she was getting along with this injury almost as if uh, uh, it was just par for the course. She had immediately after her injury an outpouring from the community. They, they inundated the hospital with gifts. People have been bringing by a, a lot of toys for the little girl. Helped by the heroics of the hospital staff, she gained strength over the next three weeks, alternately charming and breaking the hearts of the nurses with the picture of a puppy in a coloring book. She took a red crayon and she cut the dog, put a line on the dog's paw and on the dog's neck, and she said, my daddy did this. So where is daddy? He's 800 miles away in Mexico. Ramon Salcido's five-day reign of terror ends with his capture near his hometown of Las Mochas. The big news in Mexico City newspapers today is... In a rare piece of ABC News footage, Salcido's on board a plane to Mexico City, where he will be handed over to American authorities. What he says is as coldly shocking today as it was then. Are you mournful of what you did? Uh, no, really. After landing, he's paraded by Mexican officials. Come on, why did you kill the Richards family? Why did you kill your children? Why did you do that? Toward his handoff to the Americans, including the one man who has tracked him since the beginning, Detective Mike Brown. I really wanted uh, Ramon to come back to the United States and face trial and uh, have justice served upon him here. I mean, you say that very flatly, but I mean, didn't you just want to get him back here? I wanted to throw him out of the airplane at 10,000 feet. But uh, that wasn't uh, that wasn't my job or my responsibility, and and uh, and uh, so the next best thing is to treat him as though we're the only friends he has on this planet, so that we can get a confession from him. Which is precisely what Detective Brown is going to do. Within moments of passing into American airspace, he snaps this picture, and his team reads Ramon Salcido his rights. I want to let you know right now that you were under arrest for murder and attempted murder. Do you understand? I took a picture of Ramon Salcido on board the uh, aircraft because I wanted to show that uh, he was not under duress of any kind. He wasn't handcuffed. Um, he was not being mistreated. And uh, I also wanted to capture that smirk that he had on his face. Who did you kill first? I, uh, I went to kill my three daughters first. We asked him crime by crime, and uh, he readily confessed to each one. Where did you go next? Uh, after I gave my three daughters, I went to uh, uh, my mother alone. And then I went to my home, my, to my wife. And then after I gave my wife, I uh, went to my work. What do you think should happen now? I think then uh, I'm going to, to go to the electric chair. You know that you're guilty? I, yes, sir. What was the motive for this? Horrendous set of crimes. Ramon Salcido will tell you that um, he was uh, high on cocaine and had been drinking champagne all night and so it was the substance that was in his system that caused him to do that. I refuse to give him that sort of credit. You must search, you must keep searching in your head, don't you, for the reason that this violence was so extreme. I no longer try to come up with uh, a rational explanation for um, for irrational acts. Uh, it just uh, doesn't apply. By the time he returns to Sonoma, Ramon Salcido is a despised man. The mob in Santa Rosa awaiting Salcido's return from Mexico. Right now, we can do it right now. The people are here, we have the motivation, and I have a rope. Let's kill him. As much as they want to kill Ramon Salcido, the people of Sonoma County are showering his daughter, Carmina, with love, perhaps feeling that her survival is now mystically tied to their own, an outpouring of sympathy and well-wishes from local residents pour into her hospital room. By the time Carmina left the hospital, there was hardly a person in Sonoma County who did not know her name, who did not wonder what's next for this little survivor without a family. The short version is she vanished. The longer version, is best told by Carmina herself. You know, I was being told that I was no better than my dad. I, that, you know, I had 
demon blood running in me that I was, you know, I might as well have a, a cell next to him and live with him. When we come back, Carmina's new life brings back an old darkness. And then, 20 years later, she meets her father. The kind of emotions he had were sickening. Stay with us. Twenty years ago, in California's wine country, two desperately different lives are winding like grapevines into the soul of Sonoma. There's three-year-old Carmina Salcido, the lone survivor of a vicious rampage, and her father, the killer, Ramon. His trial lasts 12 weeks, ending in a guilty verdict and a death sentence. It is the order of this court that you shall suffer the death penalty. But Ramon keeps living on death row at San Quentin, while the years slip away, and everyone wonders whatever happened to little Carmina. I wondered that uh, all the time. Where is she, and is she okay, and is she doing well, and is whoever she's living with, are they taking care of her? They tried to make me, you know, a totally new person, new life, new name, everything. Carmina was adopted by an ultra-conservative Catholic family in Missouri, who she says proceeded to erase her identity right down to her name. You were reborn Cecilia. Yes. To them, Carmina Salcido died April 14th, 1989, and Cecilia lived. She was the miracle. She was the rebirth. She was a new person. Living in a 19th century cultural time warp, Cecilia had limited contact with the outside world. But at 15, she discovered a hidden box of newspaper clippings, dreadful stories from her other life long ago, even pictures of her mom in Glamour magazine. But she says in the minds of her adoptive parents, this was a taboo trail leading back to hell. I was being told that I was no better than my dad, I, that, you know, I had demon blood running in me that I was, you know, I might as well have a, a cell next to him and live with him. They, they didn't say that? Yes. They said that to you? At 17, she becomes a cloistered nun in a Nebraska convent. It was an escape. A convent was an escape. Seems a, kind of a contradiction in terms. The convent was a lifestyle that I was very willing to embrace to just get out of my adopted situation. But it's hard to meditate on Christ when all you can think about is the Father. Carmina leaves the convent and finally returns to California. She arranges to see her dad for the first time since he left her for dead 20 years ago. Were well, you scared? No. Not a little bit? Not at all. Sitting there across the table from him? Mm -mm. I went there with a very, 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 very positive attitude with high hopes. High hopes for what? High hopes to see him, you know, show not a little emotion, but a lot of emotion. But he came in like a joker, like a clown, you know, life's a joke. You know, he came smiling in, you know, I thought it would be at least walk up and be serious and just start crying when he saw me, but no emotion. Like many inmates sentenced to die, Ramon Salcido claims to have had a stunning religious conversion. After completing a mail-in seminary class, he's taken to ministering to inmates, signing his name Reverend, and posing for pictures with children. So while Reverend Ramon reads his Bible and tends to his flock from death row, he has left his own daughter in a kind of purgatory. After all, Carmina only really wanted one maybe two things from her father, either an apology or at least an explanation. She says Father Ramon was unable to give her either. Now he looked at me in the eyes the second he saw me, like he had the right to call me his daughter, like this is some big happy reunion. It's not a big happy reunion, it isn't. The kind of emotions he had were sickening. 
You know, the fact that he looked at me like I was Angela, reborn again, come back to see him. He's like, you look just like your mother. And the way he looked at me, it was like, uh-uh. Equally unsettling is what happened when Carmina showed up with her hair dyed blonde. And I was like, hey, he's going to be surprised. And he didn't act so surprised. And I was like, he's like, yeah, I saw pictures of you from MySpace. And he was like, you know, I, I like to, to try and keep track of you, you know, and I have friends that look out, you know, look out for you for me. California state law forbids death row inmates from having access to the Internet. But 2020's investigation of this matter suggests friends of Ramon's could have legally brought pictures of Carmina and hard copies of the websites into prison. How do you feel about your, your dad today? I don't ever want to see him again. And I would breathe a great sigh of relief when justice has been dealt. Carmina is not alone in feeling that way. The revulsions toward this man and his crime run deep in Sonoma, even inside the gentlest of people. Take Dr. McLeod, the surgeon who saved Carmina's life. He was a death penalty opponent when he went to testify at Salcedo's trial. I had access to the courtroom uh, without going through uh, a metal detector. And I told the DA after my testimony that, you know, I could have shot him. As for Mike Brown... I literally could go back to work and do one more job, and that would be to go to San Quentin Prison and execute Ramon Salcedo. Yourself? I would be just fine with that. Once again, it's harvest time in the vineyards of Sonoma. Brown hands racing through faded green leaves. Many seasons have passed since a killer's hands worked these same fields, harvesting the grapes of Ramon Salcedo's wrath. And now Carmina has returned to Sonoma and the cemetery where her family is buried. What emotions are evoked being in this place? I, I come to this place when, when I need to talk to my family. I would say most of all I feel peace here. Peace. Because peace. it's the closest I can be to my family in this world is right here. Um, and it's very comforting. The image of Carmina standing on this very same spot two decades ago is the jacket cover of the book she's written about her life. Carmina was not lost forever. She's been found again by those good people who helped save her life. It's great to see you. Me too. You even. And you mailed me to you. Hi, and I took care of you. I remember your little face. I can still see it. It looks the same. Some of the staff at Petaluma Valley Hospital had not seen Carmina since the day she left their care and took a piece of their hearts with her. I said, I want to take her home. That was just before you went home. I'm going to give that to you. Thank you. Good thing. Thank you so much. You know, I owe my life to somebody here and their wonderful work. So. It's a privilege. Yeah. Do you have any soreness or tightness in there? Mm, a little bit. Carmina will tell you she rarely even thinks about those physical scars she still carries. It's the deeper wounds, beyond medicine, that cannot be healed. What do you feel like you missed from your mother? Having somebody to talk to, having somebody to ask questions about life and growing up and all of that sort of stuff. Because I do have those moments where I cry and I, you know, I wish I had my sister Sophia, you know, to talk to and be like, well, what did you do when this happened? Yeah. Or mom, what did you do when life came at you like this? Who did you talk to? I've had to always be sort of a solitary soldier and just keep marching on. You know, I know my mom's really proud of me I really believe that in my heart.
The harvest is almost over now. The vineyards lie still. But the vines are not dead, just sleeping in the valley of the moon. Carmina later gave birth to a daughter and named her Zofia Angela in honor of her older sister and her mother. She still lives and works in the Sonoma area. All of Ramon Salcido's appeals have been denied and he remains on death row. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another